Hi, my little angels. Come in, come in. Everybody be welcome. I brought lots of chairs so we can sit around and talk about books. I love books. Everyone be comfortable. Yep, the rocking chair's down here, so that'll fit two of you. I've put the high back chairs all along the wall, and we have some meditation cushions. And I brought the two bar stools as well for those that need it. And the tub chairs, you can turn those around, no problem. Is everyone comfortable? Oh, I'm glad. I'm so glad you're here for our monthly meeting of the ASMR book club. Um, so, pardon? Of course I have beverage. What do you think I don't have? First of all, I'm wearing my Take Me to the Bookshop t-shirt. And for the drinks, I have something special for everyone. We have a cranberry and pineapple punch. And I have it in the matching glass. Take me to the bookstore. Gotta love books, right? And it's delicious. It's refreshing. Um, the pineapple takes away from the tart of the cranberry. It's just a lovely combination. And for those that want something warm, look what I have for us. We have the Cozy Readers Book Society. These are so great. And the cup, the glass, and the t-shirt all came from Gigi and Co. And I love this mug so much. This is going to be my fall mug for sure. And in the mug, we have Irish cream coffee because there's just something about Irish cream I love. And there's creamers. There's non-dairy creamers. There's lactose-free milk. And we have every sweetener you can think of. I have Splenda. I have Stevia. I have agave, we have honey, maple syrup, sugar, raw sugar, and brown sugar. <laughs> so everyone can make them their, their own, okay? Good. And hello, I see we have some returning little angels. Hi, my returning little angels. I'm so happy you're here. I'd love to know what you guys think of the book this month. I'll get into that in just a second. Um, but thank you so, so much for always being supportive and encouraging and loving. And please keep the comments coming. But if you're comfortable just silently watching, that's okay. Don't be shy. Come on in. Come in. I'm glad you're here and you can give it a thumbs up. You can share it. Sharing is caring. And if you want to silently watch on, that's okay. I'm glad for the support. But if you're comfortable commenting, please do. We love the comments here. I love watching you guys interact. I love interacting with you. I love knowing what you think, what you feel, what your video ideas are, your suggestions your gentle critiques. <laughs> Love all of it. And when we're able to connect like that, we take this great big world and go and make it smaller. And that's a good thing. And yes, my darlings, I colored my hair again. <laughs> so today I'm actually going to be filming not one, but two videos. I'm filming this video early. It won't be released until the 30th um, because it's my book review for the month. And I'm also going to be filming a to be read pile, um, which will be released today. So I hope you guys like that. Okay. So um, for those that aren't familiar, this is our third month of the ASMR book club. Anyone is welcome to join. Um, if you're a content creator, just at the end of the month, leave a video um, review of the book. If you don't like it, say so. If you do, say so. And if you're... <laughs> That's okay too. Um, if you don't have a channel but you still want to participate, put your report in the comments. I'd love, and I'll read it, you know. I'd love to know what your thoughts are as well. And the person, okay, so the first month was Mind Games um, by Nora Roberts, which I chose. I then chose the next month person, which was our own Jeannie B. And she did um, The Women by Kristen Hanna. And then she picked Katie Alice, who did The Tattooist of Auschwitz by Heather Morris. Now, Katie Alice will pick the next person. And when she tells me who that is and they release the book that they've chosen, I'll let all of you know. 
okay? And then you have the whole month to read it and to record. Now, this book, okay, Tattooist of Auschwitz, I didn't know what to expect. I did want to read it. I really did. Um, I've read a lot of um, books, memoirs of the time. Um, some of my favorites, if any of you know her, is Corey Tenboom, a motivational speaker who I believe was at Auschwitz. Was it Dash? No, I think it was Auschwitz. Um, it was, it's very uplifting, very uplifting. Um, this book, eh, not so much uplifting, but very well written, incredibly well written. I actually made notes as I went along. Um, because I didn't want to leave anything to chance. Okay. Um, so, it starts off at the beginning of the book with Lael. And this is the part that really... They, a notice was sent out that every family with someone over the age of 18, um, that person had to report um, they didn't know what they were reporting to, where they were going. They packed suitcases with, you know, clothes, books, comforts from home. Lael's older brother said he would go. He had a family. He had a wife and children. And Lael said, no, I will go. I'll go. So he boarded. He went and they pushed them onto basically cattle carts and the trains barely room to stand up. Um, he went into detail about the conditions, but you could almost hear the hope, you know, what was happening, we volunteered, this is okay, you know. It wasn't long before they realized. When they entered the concentration camp, which they were told was a work camp, the sign above it was in German, but it was basically work, hard work will set you free. The most ironic statement ever. Um, so that's how it opens. Now, everyone was given a job at the time. And when I first read the title, I'm like, you became the tattooist. Like, I don't think you're a good guy. My mind quickly changed quickly changed. He met the current tattooist who basically offered him a chance to be his assistant. And everybody was kept in barracks. They were numbered. And you, you got to understand how people ended up in some of these choices. Because as he's trying to tattoo the numbers as gently as he can, and as his mentor pointed out, if he doesn't do it, someone else will, and maybe they won't be as kind and gentle. He could see the guards left, right, left, right, which was basically live, die, 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 live, live. It wasn't long before he figured that out. He ended up becoming the only tattooist. Um, his mentor just disappeared. And as I said, he would go as gently as possible, but he had to tattoo. He had to do what he had to do, okay? And because of his position, he didn't have to do the hard labor. But he was given some, he gave, he was given access to extra rations, which he shared with the camp as much as he could. Okay. He was also put in a position where he met people from the outside who were coming to do work, construction work. They were building the crematoriums. And he was able to, to work out a deal with them, but I'll get to that in a bit. And when I first, as I say, I was judging him harshly at the beginning. How could you do that to your fellow man? How could you, you know, but you understood it. And for me, this book, I saw three different stories going on of people who had to do 
what they had to do. Now, he fell in love, love at first sight, with a woman who was a prisoner. And she was in the barracks where they had to go through the clothes. And they were wearing Russian uniforms at one point. Um, but a lot of people hid things in the, in the lining of the coats, in the jackets. So they would put them aside. Money sometimes was hidden. This comes into play later. Okay, so as Lyle goes on, he asks for an assistant because it's getting busier every day. And in some cases, he has to walk two miles to the other, to Auschwitz. And he's referred to as only the tattooist. He even says at one point in the book, you know, I probably would never have associated with these people in my previous life. He had money, he had a position, he was, he considered himself a bit of a playboy when it came to women. His opinion changes drastically, but he does fall in love, okay? I believe her name is Gita. And Gita falls in love with him. And in those circumstances where you are seeing death every single day, you know, his first night in the camp, his guard is walking him back to the barracks and there's a latrine built behind and there are three men sitting doing their business. And as the guard walks by, he just shoots them down, just mows them down for no reason. Um, that stays with him throughout it. He actually has conversations with his guard, but you find out later in the book, if circumstances were different, he'd have killed his guard without thinking twice. So he gets an assistant, Leon. Now in the meantime, he has started his barter system with the townspeople that are coming in. The girls that are, are sorting the jewels and things give him the jewels or some money that they can. He then gives it to the workers in exchange for bread, sausage, chocolate, which he divides very carefully amongst everyone. He hides it under his mattress. Okay. And they know that if they even had a suspicion, he could be killed. As I'm reading it, he's talking about the doctor that works there and how the doctor is going up and down the lines, grabbing women's faces, opening their mouth, examining them, grabbing their hips. This one can stay. This one comes with me. This one, this one dies. And I'm thinking to myself, I know what doctor this is. And it was Joseph Mengele. And he's very, are you keeping, are you making eye contact with me? He's very threatening. Maybe I'll take you as my next person. He asks for a favor from his jailer. Um, the jailer knows that he can get him things. And he asks for a, a better position for Gita. Is there an ability to work in the administration building? Yes. Which you think is a much better job. She's writing out names and numbers of the people that have been killed. It weighs on them. She's working with two other women, one of which is allowed to keep her hair, most beautiful hair. Everyone else has their head shaved. The captain or commander, commandant, takes an interest in her. I believe her name is Silka or Klika. Silka, I think it is. He's raping her in the back. She goes along, another person who goes along to get along. By going along, she is able to stay alive. She is able to help others because she gets favored from him. But it, you can see her shrinking within herself, losing her humanity. Now, while they are 
tattooing people, a very large man comes up to be tattooed, hasn't eaten in well over a week. And he says to, to Lil, I, I'm starving, I'm starving. He says, okay, I will hide, hide behind me. And he hides him. And he finds out what barracks he's supposed to go to. When he has a moment, he sneaks him sausage and bread. And then he gets him to sneak into the barracks so that he's there for the roll call, the twice a day roll call or more. Okay. Remember Jacob. Leon is younger. Leon is a little more belligerent, especially where Mengele is concerned. He maintains eye contact a little too long. And then they bring children in. And they're both, we are not tattooing children. We are not. And it's like tattoo them. Or, anyways, it turns out they don't have to. But meanwhile, Leon basically loses it. And he's like, no, no. But he goes on. And then Mengele comes for him. And he's taken away. And you assume he's killed. It later comes out. Leon comes back. He was already starving. Skeletal. And Lael says to him, he starved you, didn't he? I thought he was only doing it to the women. And Leon says, he did more than that. If only that was what he did. He castrated him for no reason other than to experiment. And we're not talking about a lot of aftercare either. And then the guards all knew what had happened and they referred to him from that point on as the eunuch. Lael goes back to his room one day and the Romani, the gypsies as the Germans called them, share his barracks. He plays with the children every day. When he gets there, none of the children run to him. Everyone is looking down and not maintaining eye contact. And he wonders what is going on. As he goes in, they have his mattress pulled up. They have the jewels, the money, all laid out. He knows he's dead. They question him. They take him to the punishment barrack. He's in there, he doesn't, he hears people screaming. He sees bodies being taken away. He sees the execution wall, the black wall. And then the door opens and Jacob comes in and he brings some food. And he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And Jacob reveals that he is being used his job in the camp is to get information. He tells Lael, I cannot not beat you, but I will do it in a way that you will not die. But tell me nothing. And he said, okay. Sure enough, he's taken into the room. They ask him questions. He's like, I don't know the names of the people who gave me these things. They just gave them to me. It became knowledge that he said, most of them, I think, are dead. They don't believe him. And there's no way he's going to implicate Gita and her friends. And at first, I really hated Jacob because he'd beat him within an inch of his life. Um, but he whispered to him at the end, yell, I know nothing, and faint. And he delivers the last of, of the punches, I guess. And he does. Jacob turns to them and says, he doesn't know or he would have told by now. He would have. Okay. They take him out. He never understands why he wasn't executed. I think maybe because the guards knew him. Jacob did what he had to like Silka did, like Lal did. They did what they had to to survive and they used their position to try to help as much as they could. 
he was put into hard duty. He saw his jailer and he said, please, will you do something for me? He goes, I want nothing to do with you. I don't want to be associated. He goes, just tell Silka where I am. Just tell her where I am. He tells Silka. Silka then, when she's with the commandant, gives him extra special attention and asks, may I have a favor? The next chapter, the commandant comes <clears throat> and is looking through the fence at the hard labor he's doing. And he's called out. He's given his position back as tattooist. He's also told that Leon is gone. He has been executed. This part is very triggering, so I'm just going to tell you that. While he's there, he's called, come with us. He assumes he's going to be killed. None of them know day to day what's going to happen. He's taken to the crematoriums and assumed he's going to be put in to the gas chamber and then to the... They said, no, we have two people with the same tattoo. We need you to tell us which is which. God forbid the paperwork wasn't correct. And he goes in and he sees all of the, the dead. He, it's more graphic in the book. I'm not going to go into it. They show him the two rests. And he looks and he says, you can see this one is faded. It's not a three, it's an eight. They said, you may go. And as he does, the jailer says, oh, you're probably the only Jew that stepped into the gas chamber and stepped out again. At that moment, he wanted to kill him. Soon they realize things are happening. They're seeing allied planes, the Americans fly over. Um, Gita and Silka explain that they're now shredding all documents and they realize they're going to be, you know, released. Sorry guys, I need a drink. As this goes on, he basically escapes. When they take them out, the women are being taken out. Gita has never told him her last name. As she's taken, he sees her, but he can't get to her. She yells out her last name to him. She's gone. He tries, he then escapes. He just walks away. He's given a lot of freedom as tattooist to go back and forth. So when he's told to go by himself, he's gone. He walks along and I believe it's the Russians see him and they take him they basically keep him prisoner as well in a mansion um, and he's given the job to procure party girls for them the the townspeople know who he is they go willingly but he's a pimp and he knows it one day he's given more freedom and told he can go in himself He goes, he keeps going. He gets on a, a train, he returns to his home. He sees, finds out his sister is alive. He's free, but he wants to find Gita so badly. In the meantime, Gita and her friends escape as well. They hide in the forest. They're taken in by people. At one point, they are directly across the street from people hunting them so they are allowed to sleep in the house at night but during the day they have to be gone because the homes are being searched eventually they go they're released into a town they find out that the red cross is taking names so they go she goes every day to look to see if Lael is there Lael is, is telling his family he needs to find Gita. He, this is the woman he loves. This is, you know. Finally, someone says to him, have you tried the Red Cross? And the only form of transportation is a cart and horse. 
So he takes the cart and horse. He's almost at the Red Cross when he sees three women. He stops. He's dumbfounded. He gets out. Gita stops. She can't believe what's in front of her. They run to each other. They embrace. He proposes. She accepts. <laughs> they get married. Then comes the epilogue. Up till here, I really thought I was reading a story. Maybe a synopsis of things, interviews. This is a true story. And the epilogue is what happens to Gita and Lal. And they start their business. They do well. They end up losing everything. They are able to have a child after so much trying. They lose everything again. They go to New Zealand. I believe it's New Zealand. And they start over. And the son says... Mama, how can you just start over? She says, when you don't know if you're going to live day to day, when you have lost everything, this is nothing. This is nothing. Um, she passes away. And now, now I just want to make sure I didn't miss any notes. Um, no, I, I did say everything I wanted to say. So yes, so would I recommend this book? Yes, it is incredibly well written. The facts are the facts and they are laid out. Did I judge any of them at the end of the book? No, no, not Jacob, not Silka, not Lil, not Ida. Everyone did what they had to survive and in as much as they could, they helped everyone else. In that way, I saw hope. Um, Lael lost his faith and never got it back. Um, again, you can't judge. But would I recommend this book? Yes. Yes, I would. If you're looking for a lighthearted... No. <laughs> but it is not as heavy as I thought it could be. Um, there is a soccer game in the middle of it between the guards and the best players. As it turns out, some of the players were from the national team, um, but it became common. You cannot win. They'll kill us if we win. Um, so they were allowed to score some, but eventually they had to lose. Um, so yeah, that is, let me just, The Tattooist of Auschwitz by Heather Morris. And as I said, I read it on my Kindle. I even took my stickers off my Kindle because it didn't seem right to have all these funny little sayings and I like my book spicy on this kind of a book. <laughs> I know that may sound silly to you, but that's what I felt. So, yes. Thank you, Katie Alice, for recommending this book. I really, I felt like I grew from it. And I will let you guys know what the next book in our ASMR book club is. And as always, I love you, I value you, I honor you, and I'm so very, very glad that each and every one of you was born.